pleasure now to be here to talk to you today about the trouble with technology. <laughs> Mythologically, it all began when Prometheus stole fire from the gods and presented it to humankind, delivering a gift that would, in equal parts, result in immense benefits while escalating on all the dangers. The gift was and remains an incredibly powerful technology that has changed how we live, providing light, shelter, better quality food, and a catalyst for making sophisticated tools. However, fire also offers the means to forge weapons that intensify our ability to damage each other and the environment. And fire can move beyond our control with catastrophic results, destroying indiscriminately. Despite our increasing sophistication as a species, we have not truly tamed it. And we know that it can escape. For example, in the form of uncontrollable wildfires that break out across the planet on a daily basis. Yet, without such technology, we would still be shivering in dark caves at night. Or perhaps humans may not have survived at all. The myth of Prometheus is really the description of crisis, an event so momentous that it changes everything that follows. Something like a great flood. And almost every culture as a flood myth. So says Mustafa Suleiman in his book, The Coming Wave. And as CEO of Microsoft AI, he is someone worth listening to. The book published last year and subtitled AI, Power and the 21st Century's Greatest Dilemma identifies artificial intelligence and synthetic biology as the two technologies driving the latest wave of the flood. He predicts this will be an immense challenge to our future, which both depends upon and will be imperiled by the interaction between these technologies. The French activist philosopher Bernard Stiegler proposes that technology is both the illness and the cure for humanity's position. He considers technology as much more than simply a set of tools. Recalling the ancient Greek origin of the word techne, which describes a system or a method of making or doing, an art or a craft, a technique or a practice, a way of thinking. He concluded that the significance of technology is that it defines what it actually means to be human. He suggests that it is through our development and our use of technology as a means of mediating in the world that we become human. But what is this world we inhabit? What is our reality? We have grappled with the fundamental question since the dawn of consciousness. It may be, in fact, that the true purpose of life is to arrive at an understanding of reality. This seems to be what Socrates intended when he proclaimed that the unexamined life is not worth living. Currently, as explained by theoretical physicist Sean Carroll of Johns Hopkins University, scientists actually spend more time thinking of what they do not know about the nature of reality than what they do know. He suggests the world appears to us in layers rather than one single unified thing. And so there are different ways of thinking about reality. For example, in one layer, the chair can be described in terms of its physical manifestation as a materialistic object with shape and form. It is made of cloth and fabric and wood and metal. 
In another layer, the chair is a collection of atoms, of elementary particles held together by the laws of physics. He concludes that the feature of reality that is worthy of our consideration is that there are many overlapping, seemingly different, but ultimately compatible ways of talking about it. Observing through a different lens, Alan Wallace, the American Buddhist and scholar, quotes the early American pioneer in psychology, William James, who said that what we attend to is what we wind up taking to be real, and that which we don't attend to fades out. Wallace is concerned that the weakness with modern science is that we have overlooked the nature of the observer. Neuroscience, however, is attempting to address this particular weakness. And there is now a growing belief that we predict the world into existence. Anil Seth from the University of Sussex says that we don't just perceive the world, we actively generate it. Our brains hallucinate our conscious reality. But it is a controlled hallucination in which the brain's predictions are being reined in by sensory information from the world. In fact, we're all hallucinating all the time. It's just that when we agree about our hallucinations, we call that reality. And, as is the nature of humanity, these developments have not been lost on the entrepreneurs who can see how to profit from them. In a practical demonstration of the application of this new knowledge, Gabe Newell, the head of game company Valve, discusses the near future reality of being able to write signals directly to people's minds, to change how they're feeling, or deliver better than real visuals in games. <laughs> Brain computer interfaces will lead to gaming experiences far better than a player could get through their meat peripherals, as in eyes and ears. And he adds that it will soon be possible to edit feelings digitally, saying the benefit could be the reduction or total removal of unwanted feelings or conditions from the brain for therapeutic reasons. Another leader from the game industry, John Carmack, former chief technology officer at Oculus, criticizes the lack of willingness to accept the stark economics of resource allocation. He suggests you have to make decisions about where things go. Economically, you can deliver a lot more value to a lot of people in the virtual sense. For David Chalmers, Professor of Philosophy and Neural Science at New York University, that may be a good idea because he believes that virtual reality is real. Writing that virtual worlds are not illusions or fictions, or at least they need not be, what happens in VR really happens. The objects we interact with in VR are real. Furthermore, recalling Socrates' dictum, he adds that life in virtual worlds can be as good in principle as life outside virtual worlds. You can lead a fully meaningful life in a virtual world. History shows, of course, that new technologies have always posed challenges to the nature of humanity. For example, over 2,000 years ago, Plato noted that the technology of writing would usurp the role of rhetoric. In Phaedrus, he has Socrates retell the origin of writing. What you have discovered is a recipe not from memory, but a reminder. And it is no true wisdom that you offer your disciples, but only the semblance of wisdom. For by telling them of many things without teaching them, you will make them seem to know much, while for the most part they know nothing. 
current developments in AI, VR, and biotech coincide with what sometimes appears to be a growing lack of consensus around exactly what is reality. We are living through an existential crisis that seems even more absurd than that proposed by John Paul Sartre in the 1940s. This is the era, era of fake news, alternative facts, deep fake videos, mistrust of experts, and an increasing public reluctance to believe scientific evidence. For those of us in education, it occurs as the very nature of the university is being challenged in wider society. Michael D. Higgins, President of Ireland, poet and academic, warns of the increasing threat not only to academic freedom, but to the very nature of the university as a place of independent learning. He argues that the community of scholarship is in peril. And we must now consider not just the loss of academic freedom at the level of the individual scholar, but the loss of the institution of the university itself, even the space of the university discourse. The ideal of the university is a privileged space a safe place where students, teachers, and researchers are free to explore ideas without fear of retribution. And the value of this privilege is recognized in many jurisdictions. Academic freedom is protected by legislation precisely to ensure that unorthodox, controversial, and even dangerous thinking can flourish, thus leading to new insights developments, and inventions to benefit humankind. During the summer, the European Parliament considered a study on the protection of academic freedom, which concluded that potential limits to academic freedom are thought to come from governments, politics, for-profit organizations, and international research partners. However, Intrusions into academic freedom may also come from internal sources, particularly due to the managerialization and bureaucratization of universities and internal academic pressures. The study proposes a number of policy options, including the introduction of a binding legal definition of academic freedom. However, is academic freedom something of an illusion? Modern universities originated in medieval European monasteries, and from the very beginning, there were forbidden ideas and directions of exploration that were closed. Academic activity requires time, along with access to well-equipped laboratories, so scholars have always needed patronage of one sort or another. And patronage is not always a dead fellow with freedom. But much current research and development in technology does not even take place in universities. Young entrepreneurial startups and global corporate organizations are breaking previous technological and social boundaries with support from powerful venture capitalists intending to bring new and exciting products to market. They recognize the opportunities in this space and are seeking the significant rewards that are likely to be won by those who are most successful. Playing for such high stakes, it comes as no surprise that not only is academic freedom at risk, but also ethical behavior. The training of large language models on copyright <laughs> material is currently under the spotlight. Mustafa Suleiman recently went so far as to suggest that anything posted to the internet is fair game. Meanwhile, actors are concerned about AI imitations being used without license, and writers worry that AI will render them redundant. 
This is also a worry for many other professions. Weighing the legitimate concerns against the undisputed benefits of AI is no simple matter. It is important for the health of our society that debate around the development of any new technology is fostered and encouraged. AI, VR, and biotech is already shaping our future society, and therefore we in education must give it particular scrutiny. So to this morning, I want to conclude by proposing five fundamental principles that higher education might consider when incorporating new technologies into the workflow. Sir John Strachey, an English civil servant, speaking of India in 1888, claimed there is no such country. This Victorian perspective justified the continued exploitation of the continent by the empire. And Diana Egg, the Harvard scholar, explains that through the lens of the 19th century West, a lens ground to bring to focus a particular political conception of the nation state, India as a concept did not exist. This attitude remains a powerful and influential idea in the global north almost a century and a half later. However, India's diversity and capacity for multi-layered complexity, along with the refusal of singularity, seems contemporary and even more relevant in today's world than it might have been then. This is reflected in the writing of Francophone, Francophone Lebanese author Amin Maluth's description of personal identity as an equally complex conjugation. So, am I half French and half Lebanese? Of course not. I haven't got several identities. I've got just one, made up of many components in a mixture that is unique to me, just as other people's identities are unique to them as individuals. So, the entitlement of identity is a fundamental right. It is the first principle to be encoded in a technological ecosystem for education. In Poetics of Relation, Edouard Lisson, the Mar Marginican poet and philosopher, demands the right to opacity for the oppressed, to counteract the one-way transparency imposed by colonialism. He argues that the theory of difference is invaluable because it made possible the rightful entitlement to recognition of the minorities swarming throughout the world and the defense of their status. Adding, however, that difference itse itself can still be tried to reduce things to the transparent, he concludes the problem arises from the lens of Western thought. In order to understand and thus, and thus accept you, I have to measure your solidity with the ideal scale providing me with grounds to make comparisons and perhaps judgments. I have to reduce, I admit you to existence within my system. I create you afresh. Therefore, we should agree not merely to the right to difference, but carrying this further, agree also to the right to opacity. He reasons that the opaque is not the obscure. It is that which cannot be reduced. The othering of the colonized, the dehumanization of the enslaved, is based on the lens of exploitation and denial of any alternative reality. Without a recognition and acknowledgement of this, there cannot be an honest conversation and the notion of transparency is rendered ridiculous. The entitlement to opacity is the second principle to be encoded in a technological ecosystem for education.
Bo Ventura de Souza Santos, a Portuguese sociologist, identifies the global south as a metaphor for human suffering caused by capitalism and colonialism on a global level. Not only located in the southern hemisphere, this global south exists in the geographic north in isolated and silenced communities. The problem is that after five centuries of teaching the world, the global north seems to have lost the capacity to learn from the experience of the world. In other words, it looks as if colonialism has disabled the global north from learning in non-colonial terms and is unable to allow the existence of any knowledge other than the so-called universal knowledge of the West. Acceptance of diverse forms of knowledge on an equal basis is the third principle to be encoded in a technological ecosystem for education. Concerns about the threat to academic freedom and access to technology engender caution on the part of universities when engaging with the corporate sector to develop technology for education. However, it should not be the goal to exclude the sector. For example, Purdue University in Indiana and its VR technology partner, Kitware, developed an immersive learning program for nursing students using the Oculus Quest head-mounted device to produce an affordable and effective training experience. Both agree that open source software naturally supports a service business model because it enables others to take advantage of the software platforms and avoid vendor knocking. While Kitware encourages open source software, data sharing, and open access publication whenever possible, the company also respects the need for proprietary solutions due to competitive, privacy, security, and regulatory considerations and restrictions. Open source and freedom of access is the fourth principle to be encoded in a technological ecosystem for education. The clean and pure environment most commonly presented in VR can mask some disturbing facts. According to British writer, artist, and technologist James Bridle, computer systems draw a huge amount of energy. Already, it's estimated that computer use around the world is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire airline industry. This means that data centers springing up around the world to support cloud computing, including access to VR, is having as significant an impact on the physical environment as if we were flying to these locations. The same also applies to AI. As the technosphere continues to encroach on the biosphere, exhausting the planet's ability to renew the resources needed to support human life, the inevitable conclusion has been clear for some time. The world scientist's warning to humanity as far back as 2017 bluntly states <laughs> that we are jeopardizing our future. A responsible and accountable approach to sustainability is the fifth principle to be encoded in a technological ecosystem for education. In conclusion, we cannot afford to view technology and the tools we use as separate from us, something to be taken up and put down without consequence. Technology is an integral part of being human. It is the way we become you. The manner in which we enable technology determines the nature of our civilization. Thinking of technology in this way as both the cure and the illness, particularly in this age of the Anthropocene, where our intervention is affecting the physical health of our environment, presents academia generally and education specifically 
with a singular responsibility. Our task is to ensure the upcoming generation is aware of its true potential. We are not at the mercy of technological development, but actively engaged in a conversation, a negotiation about what it means to be human. Thank you.